All right. Okay. Sorry. I, I lost a precious few minutes. So I have to, uh, uh, yeah. So dispense with the uh, pleasantries. We'll go right in. Okay. This is all in, uh, um, inspired by uh, Sang Feng's uh, work, of course. Uh, this uh, Tungsten Diterra is a magic material. Uh, it does everything uh, topological, superconducting, and uh, now has this uh, amazing quantum oscillations. And uh, so I think the main question are two folds. Uh, um, actually, you know, <clears throat> it's not even not, not clear what's the origin of the insulator because by, by according to band structure, let's see, how do I get a pointer going? Can you see my pointer? Can you see this pointer? Yes. Uh, yes, we can see your pointer. Okay, I just use a cursor then. Uh, what causes the insulator? Because according to band structure, it should be a semi-metal, right? <clears throat> and so actually, um, Sang Fan didn't get to the second paper, which is a very nice uh, paper that uh, I think they demonstrated that this is actually an example of a topological, uh, of an exotonic insulator, which by itself is a very exciting development. And it's, uh, now the focus of this uh, workshop is of course on the quantum oscillation. So the question is, uh, is there, what's the explanation? Um, Sang Fan in his paper suggested uh, fractionalization and, and so on and so forth, but I find that not so well motivated uh, because fractionalization is usually seen in uh, strongly correlated material, near mod insulator or, or condo insulators. <clears throat> and we don't have that. Uh, I think these things uh, are not considered to be um, strongly correlated, uh, at least up to now. Um, so, of course, my instinct is to try to find the simplest uh, uh, explanation as possible uh, before going, venturing into something exotic. So I, uh, so I made a proposal that uh, if it were an exotonic insulator, then a relatively conventional explanation is possible. So let me try to explain that today. Uh, so the data went by very fast. I can show it again, you know, see these oscillations as a function of, uh, um, of, uh, of gate, uh, um, when you move this uh, um, um, uh, uh, nice oscillations and, and uh, Now I point the advances. Okay. And you know, if, as they go to low temperature, these even becomes uh, very sharp spikes. Okay. So the first uh, point I want, want to make is that uh, you can make a very, very simple phenomenological model. And uh, so an insulate, if you have an insulator with a gap, uh, then the conductivity is of course activated. But if that gap is modulated as a function of magnetic field uh, in, the, in the usual way with a magnitude delta, then the, the ratio of the conductivity, Note, notice this, the ratio uh, would be modulated. And it, the modulation depends only on the ratio of the modulation of the gap to KT, okay? And not on the gap itself. So you can have a very, very strong insulator with a very large delta knot. And as even if, if you have a small gap modulation, if you go to temperature small compared with that small modulation, you can get enormous uh, uh, oscillation in the ratio. Not in the you know the absolute value, so because everything is dying very quickly, but the ratio <clears throat> can show very strong oscillation. So that's a very simple observation. Uh, now nowadays we all understand the power of the exponential growth, uh, even men on the street. Um, so this is part part of the power of the exponential growth that the ratio can have this uh, perhaps unexpected behavior. Okay. So the thesis is then simply that um, uh, if <clears throat> if there's a gap of some unknown origin. And if the gap is oscillating, has some modulation with field, then you can see uh, small oscillations when temperature is high, and even just enormous, uh, uh, looks like quantized oscillations uh, when the temperature is low. So the qu question is, what is the origin of the gap oscillation? Uh, uh, of course, uh, from yesterday, I learned that uh, looking at this video that it could be extrinsic. There's uh, still a debate going on, and I think it would take time for the dust to settle. Um, so let me uh, put that aside for a minute. So the other uh, idea is that uh, if it's an exotonic insulator, uh, then I, I just follow up on uh, earlier work by uh, Nigel Cooper and, and also Fan Wang um, on a different context. It's actually introduced in a different in the context of uh, uh, semi-aramic hexafluoride. Uh, then, um, then they can have uh, gap oscillations. Okay, so this is a, uh, work is published, uh, and then uh, recently I got help from uh, my postdoc when you a, hey, and I tell you a little bit about, more about that. Okay, now so I just want to remark that after listening to yesterday's talk, this this idea that resistivity oscillations 
due to the gap modulation is very general, okay? And so I, it just occurred to me that maybe it could explain uh, the gap uh, the oscillations in uh, uh, ytterbium uh, bismuth uh, uh, boron 12. Uh, it kind of looks similar to what Zhang is seeing. Uh, so that's just uh, uh, something to uh, keep in mind. Now, what's the exotonic insulator? Well, I like all good things. Uh, it actually started from Mott. I, I actually didn't know that. I, I always thought it was uh, Keldish at Kipayev. So the idea is that if you have a semi-metal with the electron and hole side, uh, if there's a strong attraction, you can actually uh, spontaneously form a pair, uh, form an exciton, which condensed and uh, give you a gap. In a weak coupling, then you can kind of have a nesting situation. You're going to shift this uh, whole, whole situation over here. And the, 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 the mathematics actually looks like a PCS uh, theory. Okay, and then you can gap out this, uh, this, this thing. Okay, and that was developed by um, Morris Rice and Kong and, and so on, and all these people uh, years ago. And uh, so uh, this um, tungsten diterite actually is a good candidate because uh, you, you look at the band structure, it is a, there's a hole pocket in the gamma point and, uh, and the electron pocket is, uh, comes down uh, here, okay? And if you, um, yeah, if you blow this up, uh, so there's a, uh, there's a hole pocket here. And so the, the Fermi surface act actually looks like this. There's a kind of elongated hole pocket and two little electron pockets, right? Okay, so the idea is that can, is it possible because of the very small uh, gap, uh, small overlap, uh, and that uh, there's strong attraction due to uh, poor screening because it's low density, this may actually be a good candidate for isotonic insulator. Now, if that's true, then I think uh, it's actually a very exciting system because as far as I know, this may be the first can uh, first uh, demonstration of this. Uh, I may be wrong, but I think there are 100 experts out there. Uh, please correct me. Uh, for example, one key titanium selenide in the bulk was claimed to be exotonic insulated, but there was a kind of transition, uh, but, but eventually the ground state is metallic. I think it's because it's bulk. So I think it would be very interesting to study gated monolayer. So maybe that could potentially could be another uh, very interesting example of, of this thing. Okay. Now, once you accept it as a um, um, as exotonic insulator, then then I can just borrow uh, what was done before uh, uh, in the context of uh, of uh, Hamir Hexabarite, uh, and then you you, you get uh, quantum oscillations of the gap. Uh, so the idea is the same. Uh, you have an electron band in a, in a magnetic field. The uh, this becomes quantized, uh, and your whole band you can quantize. Uh, in a magnetic field, these guys move upwards. And uh, these guys move downwards. Oops, let me go back. Uh, and you know, then, then at the Fermi level, these things can cross. And, and when they cross, they hybridize. And as a result, you get these scallops uh, coming in like that. Okay, so you get these quantum oscillations. So, th so this is a very natural way to get oscillation in the gap magnitude. And the size of the oscillation is actually the square of the uh, um, cyclotron frequency divided by the gap itself. Okay, so it could be small, but uh, as I said before, you could have very small modulation of the order of a few Kelvin, and if you go below that, you can get huge uh, uh, oscillations and resistivity ratio. Okay, now the story doesn't end there because uh, uh, our story is a little bit more complicated. Uh, this picture originally was developed for a single electron band and a single hole band, but now we have a little more complicated situation. We have one hole band and two electron bands. So the problem now is that there's no perfect nesting. Uh, so the superconducting analogy doesn't work. And so you need a finite attraction strength to open up a gap. And um, furthermore, uh, you have the uh, question of uh, what is this Q? You know, we have to shift this, uh, 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 we need a Q to shift this to, to overlap, to make these gaps. Uh, so in general, this Q is not gonna be the Q naught, right? Because, um, yeah, so, so that gives rise to, to the following problem. So the, it's not actually not so easy to extend what is done before from the one hole to the whole, whole situation. So I, uh, when I wrote this paper, I inserted a sentence. Uh, I want to test whether, you know, if, a, if an author confessed his own uh, inadequacy, whether this will get past the, uh, the uh, referee or the uh, editor of his rep. So apparently it did. So, so I said that this is a task which is beyond the ability of this author. Uh, fortunately, uh, I, my post uh, when you hate and came to the rescue and he uh, is, is now working on tackling this uh, two electron one hole problem. 
So let me just say quickly, uh, this is still a work in progress. So the idea is that uh, we now want to treat the coupling of a hole and two electron band shifted by Q. And there's matrix element V1, which makes us the electron and the hole, and the V2, which makes uh, couples the electron bands. So it's actually a rather larger uh, phase space, V1, V2, and the Q. And these should be dependent self-consistently uh, for a given interaction model uh, to, find, uh, to, to find a gap and, and so on and so forth. So one thing uh, is that uh, you, know, you could imagine that this Q is not the, the Q naught because you could shift them so that the, the, there's tangent, right? The, this red is tangential to the, to the blue. Uh, then you can take advantage of these uh, peaks in the susceptibility. So, um, so uh, he, he took a Landau gauge and let me just uh, tell you where we are at the moment. In the simplest case, if both electron holes are isotropic and then we can shift it so that the Q Q naught, then this maps back to the original problem, it turns out, and uh, you find quantum oscillations. Now in the general case, we have an anisotropic band. Uh, we have an anisotropic, uh, I lost uh, something here. Uh, we have a, um, a anisotropic hole pocket and more or less isotropic electron pocket. Uh, in that case, if we shift it Q equal to Q naught, then it turns out that the, all the Landau indices are coupled. We don't have, have a three by three anymore. And then in that case, we don't get quantum oscillations. You see, it's almost flat. On the other hand, if you can fine tune the Q and the V naught so that the, uh, the, the electron pocket after hybridization actually has a good nesting with a hole, then again, you get this uh, nice quantum oscillation again, okay? Uh, so my speculation at this point is that in the self-consistent calculation, the system was self-tuned to a well-nested uh, um, uh, situation uh, to maximize the gap. And then we may find quantum oscillation over a reasonably large region of parameter space. Uh, how much, how large it is, I don't know, but at least there's a chance that this uh, scenario may work for the two electron one hole uh, situation. Uh, whether this actually applies to tungsten diterite, uh, I don't know. Okay, so uh, the uh, so that's the end of my tungsten diterite story. Uh, the organizers asked me to give a brief uh, sort of outsider's introduction to the panel discussion that's coming up. So let me quickly go over this uh, because it is kind of related to what I said. Uh, first, uh, you know, there's a non-exotic, uh, I would say, uh, explanation and this uh, is, uh, was really started by uh, Cooper and, and Fa Wang and so on, it has to do with hybridization gap and magnetic breakdown. First, let me say that you know many of the key players are here on the panel, so I, I just have to give a laundry list. The second one is a, uh, a neutral fermion picture you need fractionalization. So the idea is to have level fractionalized into spin-ons and holons. The holon binds the electron to form exciton, uh, but this will be a fermionic exciton which has the same quantum number as the spin-on. So at the end of the day, you get some kind of spin-on Fermi surface. Um, right, so again, I think this probably is more plausible in, in the case of Zemmerum uh, hexaporite, uh, but less so in uh, tungsten diterite. So a, an important point is that the neutral fermion sees a gauge magnetic field, which is proportional to B, but then the quantum oscillation period would in general not be the same as uh, what you expect in the magnetic, in a, in a charge case. Uh, finally, there are several papers that talk about neutral Marana fermions. So these are kind of getting more and more exotic. And again, I can break it down to two classes, the original discussions and also by Coleman at all, uh, by Pascal and by Coleman. I think they break U1 symmetry because usually we associate Marana with uh, Suman activity. Uh, there's a recent paper by Chandra Bama, which doesn't break U1 symmetry. And I will look forward to a lively discussion on that. One question I might pose already now is that I'd like to know what is the AC conductivity of these kind of models. I know the answer for the neutral fermion case is a power law uh, bigger than two. Uh, so it, it, these neutral fermions are behaving kind of like dipoles. Uh, are, they similar, uh, are they similar prediction for Marana? Uh, are they experiments? Yesterday I saw some terahertz data for Amitage, but I think it will be really interesting to go down to microwave uh, to, to try to see some of these. So, okay, so my time is up and uh, sorry for my uh, inadequacy with uh, Zoom. Thank you. Let's thank the speaker again. Let's thank the speaker. Um, I think we'll have time for maybe one or maybe two, even two questions. Uh, are there any questions? See any hand raising emojis here? 
So I think uh, Professor Chandra Barma asked a question. Would you like to ask? Yes, please go ahead, Professor Varma. Okay. What's the, what's the uh, argument or experimental evidence that uh, local correlations on tungsten are unimportant, while the correlations between uh, tungsten and tellurium are very important? Yeah, um, so I, I guess I'm just looking at the band structure because uh, you know, we're talking about very low density. Uh, you look at these bands, um, so they, you know, they, they are just pretty ordinary band. They are pretty wide bandwidth and, and you're looking at very low density. Okay. Um, so I think these very local correlations, I, I really don't see it. It's not like the local moments. There's no, no sign of local moment formation, no, uh, you know, no strange thing in susceptibility. So I think it's very different from, from the F level. When I looked at the band structure, I found that over uh, two thirds of the zone, yeah. the tungsten band was flat. Yeah, right. So, but these are away from the Fermi surface, um, right? So and we, we cannot really trust what these bands are doing. Um, you know, they're relatively flat, but you know, at the Fermi surface, we have these, um, and, and experimental evidence shows that we, we have a low density of carriers, a semi-metal with very low density carriers with a quite ordinary looking band. So I, I always find it very odd that uh, nearest neighbor correlation should be yeah. significantly more important than on-site correlations. No, no, it's not nearest neighbor. You know, we're talking about uh, very low density. So we're talking about Coulomb interaction <clears throat> on the scale of, uh, you know, maybe, uh, maybe 10 letter spacing apart. <clears throat> These are very, you know, very dilute system. Very few electrons and very few holes. So we should look on the long wavelength limit, not not on the on-site limit. That's that's my that's my thinking. 